Well, bright good morning to everybody, and welcome to Plants, Pests, and Pathogens, the June edition. Um, appreciate uh, you guys joining us this morning. Would love for you to type your name in your county in the chat box, and if you're participating with a group of folks, give us the number of people that are participating at your login site. That would be really helpful. Uh, if you haven't already run the audio setup wizard, please do. You can just go up to, to the tools menu at the top of the page. Um, Click audio, audio setup wizard, and that'll make sure that we'll be able to hear you and you'll be able to hear us. Uh, everything that you type in the chat box is visible to all of the moderators. There is no privacy on, on uh, Collaborate, so be sure that you're, you're only putting related items in, into the box. When, when you're not actually asking a question or giving information related to the, the program, please keep your microphone turned off because uh, that will prevent any feedback or, or picking up of, of background noises from your site. Agents, if you haven't already registered on LMS to get uh, credit for the, the class this morning, please do so. My name is Lucy Bradley. I'm the NC State Urban Horticulture Specialist, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this morning. I'm also delighted to be able to introduce you to B.J. Temple, who's the instructional technologist who who's the Wonder Woman behind the success of the, these Collaborate sessions. Lee Day, good morning. Good morning, everyone. What I'd like to do is walk you through the Collaborate interface, just in case you're new. So what I have on the screen here is what you should see to your left. Um, at the top, you have the audio and video area. and um, as Lucy said, if you're not um, talking, we'd like for you to um, keep that talk button off. Um, but if you do need to talk, there's the button um, that you would press to um, let us hear you. Below that is the participants area. And in this area, there are four icons that um, might be of use to you. The first is um, an emoticon. And that lets you just you know, share if you're happy or sad or confused or um, things like that. The um, second one is if you need to step away, um, it will let us know that you're not at your computer. The third is a, a hand icon, and it lets you know, um, lets us know if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, and then the fourth is an interaction icon. Um, by default, it's a check mark. If you click on it, um, you will be able to select a green check or a red X. So I'd like for you to go ahead and click a, a green check um, if you can hear me and you see what I'm talking about. Awesome. It looks like uh, just about everybody has found it. Um, that check will turn to uh, the letter A. If there's a multiple choice question that we want you to answer, it'll be in that same spot. Um, just to the right of the participant area um, is a toolbar. And um, the second icon down looks like a starburst or a sun. Um, that will let us. Um, see you know, if you're pointing to something uh, on the whiteboard. And we'll use that on the next slide. Um, as Lucy said, there's a chat area. You can type in the chat room um, and ask questions for um, the presenters or for me as technical help um, if you need it. So what I'd like for you to do is to use that starburst that I told you about and click on the map where you are located. I'm in Wake County, so I'm going to click my little sunshine on Wake County. All right, back to you, Lucy. Great, thank you, Lee J. So today we are focused on um, plant problem diagnosis, and we're going to do that with some problem-solving sessions for you to get engaged in uh, in breakout rooms. So when we get ready to do the actual diagnosis, we're going to split up into four different sections, and that will happen automatically. There's nothing that you need to do to move to the breakout room. Um, Lee J will uh, disperse us all to, to different breakout rooms where 
will um, go through the, the diagnostic process. What we're looking for is focusing on the diagnostic process. If you look at the, the challenge and you see right away you know what it is, please don't just give the answer away. Please focus on helping other people understand the process and how you get to that answer. Our goals are going to be to identify what additional information might be needed for you to get to a diagnosis, to identify what types of samples you might need to submit to, to get further information, and to rule out other problems that, that it couldn't possibly be. When you get bumped to the, the um, breakout rooms, you'll have to turn your microphone on again. It automatically turns your mic off when you go to the, to the, to the breakout room. Any questions about how the breakouts are going to work? Okay, well, feel free to ask the questions come up. Today we're going to be focused on, on vegetables, summertime um, vegetable issues. And the layout for today's program is we're going to talk a little bit about seasonal information, then we're going to have, to have a demonstration. Mike and Matt will work through the process of diagnosing a couple of problems, and then we'll split up into our breakout rooms for some participatory problem solving, and then we'll come back and go over those issues as a group. So it's summer. You know, yesterday was the longest day of the year, so those long day, day lengths lead to higher temperatures, and the temperatures are higher not only during the day but at night. So plants need more irrigation than they need when, it, when it's cooler. Though wilting doesn't always indicate that you need to water. Sometimes even when the soil is moist, the plant can't take up the moisture fast enough to keep the leaves turgid. So um, that's not a, a, a perfect in indicator. You want to check the soil. Precipitation usually comes in the form of afternoon thunder showers, although lately they've been middle of the night <laughs> thunder showers. And we have high humidity, and that can be a problem with disease development, create ideal disease conditions for, for diseases. It's really important to stay on top of harvest so that um, you prevent damage to your crop, but also to prevent pest and disease buildup. So this month is vegetables. Can turn it over to Mike and Matt. All right. If everybody can hear me, please give a green check. Great. It looks like we've got a quorum anyway for this first part, which again will be a couple of diagnostic walkthroughs. We're going to just take you first, me, then Matt, uh, me and then Matt again through a few situations, some of the observations you want to make, the questions you want to ask, and what kind of conclusions you can come to. Case number one, and these are actually, the walkthroughs are composite cases, so not all the photographs are from the same situation necessarily, unlike the breakout room scenarios that we'll walk through or we'll uh, have you walk through. But uh, here's a case of tomato plant in the midsummer. This photograph from Alan Durden in Franklin County. And we can see some yellowing here on these leaves and spotting. We also see some curling. Now, Lucy just mentioned the, the fact that plants can wilt, or in the case of tomatoes, the leaves curl when they're under stress from, uh, from high temperatures, can't transpire enough water. So the rolling here is really not a part of the problem that we want to look at. We're going to discount that. But we're going to concentrate on these yellow things. So when you first see it, especially when you see they're starting to turn dark and the spot's dying in the middle, you might wonder, do we have some kind of a disease problem? Or what exactly is going on? So the, the kinds of information that you want to have in addition to just the leaf that you're seeing, because one leaf is not enough, even if we look at it closely, we'll notice that there doesn't seem to be much of um, or any presence of fungi to lead you to believe that it could be some kind of a foliar fungal disease. But what else do we need to know? Well, one of the things that's not obvious from the sample is where on the plant this problem is occurring. And in this case, is something that's happening down farther on the plant. So it's the lower leaves that are being affected. 
And we'd also want to know what was happening in terms of the cultural practices. So you would want to ask about that. In this case, you would learn that the plant did receive lime and pre-plant fertilizer applications according to test recommendations, and that calcium nitrate was being applied. Um, and so those are, are helpful things to know, because what it's going to turn out in this case, and this is another um, little piece of information here, the plants, what age are they? Well, they're already six weeks old, but half of them are affected. So that leads us right there to maybe lean toward it being some kind of an environmental or cultural problem rather than an infectious disease, because so many were affected so quickly. Since there's no wilting or root rot or stem rot present, we want to ask about those and look for those. That's going to rule out a lot of our diseases right there. And the foliar diseases we're not probably going to look for, uh, first of all, because we didn't see any fungi, although they may not be present sporulating just yet on the surface. But for another reason that I'll mention in a minute, we're going to probably not suspect a foliar disease even. And that is that this intervenal chlorosis, we call it, this yellowing between the veins, is very uniform. It's not irregular across the leaf, but extremely uniform, which makes us wonder, do we have some kind of a nutrient deficiency? And since the lower leaves were affected first, we suspect it's a mobile nutrient. Remember that the plants are able to mobilize certain things, like nitrogen, out of the lower leaves and move them up into the new growth. So mobile nutrients produce symptoms first on the lower leaves. In the case of the immobile nutrients, like, for example, iron, you would see those symptoms first on the upper leaves because the plant is not able to take those out of the existing foliage and move them to the new growth. And as it turns out, in this particular case, these symptoms, intervenal chlorosis of the lower foliage on tomato, that tends then later to turn necrotic or die, as you can see in some of the spots here where we've got we've got some death occurring in those yellowed areas. This is classic magnesium deficiency on tomato. The other clue here in what we gathered as far as information is the fact that calcium nitrate was being applied. Now that's great because Obviously, the plants need nitrogen, and they need that calcium to avoid blossom and end rot on the fruit. But the calcium ions, as well as potassium and ammonium ions in the soil, are competing with the magnesium for root uptake. So they're all kind of crowded at the door there. And the magnesium tends to get more crowded out if there are a lot of the other ions present. And what happens is you get magnesium deficiency. So the, the remedy here, and I'm not a plant nutrition expert, but in at least uh, one recent case here that our uh, floriculturist actually recommended the treatment for this problem in tomato as Epsom salt. So I believe it was two pounds per 100 gallons as a, uh, as a treatment to start with, and then monthly treatments of, I think it was a pound of Epsom salts per 100 gallons of water after that, but don't quote me on that. Just the um, important thing is to get some magnesium back into those plants. Turn it over to Matt for walkthrough diagnosis, case two. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Maybe some checks if you can. OK. All right, great. Um, OK, so this one is going to be a pretty straightforward one. But uh, this is what often happens to vegetables when there's uh, when there's things about, not diseases. Um, and so we have these arugula, arugula and greens showing major damage. Um, and a quote from the person is, the, the plants were fine the other day, but when I came out today, they were destroyed. Almost all the leaves are eaten. So they're already assuming that it's some bug. We uh, We know it's... Uh, does not look like a disease. Um, Mike can confirm probably that no diseases make plants look like that. Are there any, Mike, you can think of? None on this planet that I know of. Okay, good. So, so um, 
So basically, uh, we've got this situation going on here, but we really have to identify which thing is affecting it. So, um, okay, we look a little closer up, and uh, huh, you might notice that there's something here. And let's uh, look a little closer. Okay, so what you have there is a striped flea beetle. And if you notice here also, there's a, uh, a flea hopper. So we've got a beetle and a bug. Uh, so we can basically rule out the bug. A bug is not going to take big chomps out of a uh, plant. They're sucking insects, so they're going to create usually a stippling pattern um, or some kind of uh, distortion, but they don't take tissue away from the plants. They basically just suck the juices and suck the contents of the, uh, of the plant cells. Uh, flea beetles do uh, eat um, the foliage, and they will remove tissues. But typically, flea beetles either make little shot holes, little tiny holes in it, uh, especially since this is a very small insect, only a few millimeters long, uh, or they skeletonize plants, uh, and not in this drastic skeletonizing we see here, where only really the veins, the major veins, are left. So um, what you can do is look around the plant a little bit more. You can actually see some evidence here, but we're going to look a little closer. You can see a lot of black specks here, a lot of what we call frass, the uh, insect poop, basically. And um, there aren't a lot of, you know, bugs won't create these kind of pellet-like frass. Usually they're going to have a sticky, kind of liquidy uh, excrement that they, that they stick on the leaves. Uh, so this right here, when you see the frass, little pellets and black pellets of frass, that to me first screams caterpillar. But it could also be a beetle, a leaf beetle larva or something like that. Now, some of you may actually see in this photo that there is actually something right here uh, in the upper top uh, right corner. And in fact, if you were to investigate further, you would have no problem finding the culprit, which are all these caterpillars uh, chewing it up. Um, and this is what happens where things can happen overnight or, you know, when people say overnight, it's probably that they didn't look at them you know, a couple of days in a row and uh, they looked at them the first day and they looked fine. And then a couple of days later, these caterpillars are extremely voracious and they're basically destroying uh, all of the leaf tissue as fast as they can because they want to grow up to be nice, healthy adults and they're going to do it as quickly as possible. Um, another thing to look out for, and it's hard to see here, you might see a little bit down here, um, is in the case of caterpillars, you'll also often see a little bit of silk uh, because caterpillars create a lot of silk, um, which would not be present if beetles were the case. Uh, and beetles can do this similar damage. Sawflies can, but typically we don't see a lot of sawflies on uh, vegetables. We see them mostly on ornamentals. Um, and so we're mostly going to be thinking about caterpillars. And if we were to look at these, we would also see that it has five or less prolegs. they got crochets and things like that. So what is this? Um, well, these are, again, arugula and uh, greens. Um, so this is actually the cross-striped cabbage worm. This is a crambid moth. Uh, basically, it used to be pyralidae. Um, and these feed on brassicaceae. The eggs are laid in batches, and this is what results in many larvae uh, at the same time feeding on the plant. Um, and uh, for control in the Ag Chem Manual, there's actually several um, general control chemicals for uh, cabbage and uh, brassican uh, caterpillar control, uh, including Bt. Uh, so you can read a couple of them and look at the the um, the application, and of course, because this is a vegetable, there's uh, certain other limitations to applying chemicals than if this were not being eaten. If this were caterpillars on an ornamental, you could uh, spray it and and uh, not worry about whether you have to wait uh, to eat it. Uh, so basically, this is uh, look up some of these controls for this specific pest. Um, Okay, Lucy says, free protein for your chickens or koi. Yeah, that's great. So if you have only a few plants, basically if you scout these and you start to see a couple little holes, you can start to find the larvae pretty quickly. Um, 
and uh, remove them by hand. Uh, if they get once they get to this size, they're going to be eating a lot already. So you, it's by the time you can pick them off by hand, you, there's going to be a lot of damage already. Um, and so basically, scouting uh, the the ad the moths are going to be hard. It's not like the cabbage butterflies where you'll see them flying around uh, the garden around these types of crops. Um, you're you're not going to see these moths because they're going to be laying eggs at night. And so you won't be kind of attuned to, oh, I better watch out for these new caterpillars that are coming out. Um, OK, um, I think that's it for walkthrough case two. So I'll turn it back over to Mike. All right, thanks, Matt. I see that um, Carteret County answered the question that Allison had posed about Epsom salts as a soil drench. If you didn't see that in the chat box, yes, it is. We're talking about dissolving them in water and using it for uh, for watering the plants. The um, other thing I just learned was that there is such a thing as a free lunch, but only if you're a chicken or a goldfish and it's, it's caterpillars. Walkthrough diagnosis case three. Host this time will be cucumber and the season, again, summertime. And we'll be looking at a case of what appears to be stunting of the plants, maybe some wilting, but general across the plant, not individual vines. So you don't have a plant that has one vine that looks good and another vine severely wilted. That would be indication of some other kind of problem. So here it's, it's general. Another thing you want to look at is the pattern in the, the garden or in the field. So in this case, let's say we've got a, or we can see that we have a clumped pattern where affected plants are in small groups or certain areas of, are affected and others not. And when we see that, that tends to be a clue that there is a problem in the soil. It could be disease or some other kind of soil issue. We will also say here that there are no actual lesions or decay areas evident on the stems. If we look closely at the leaves, we might see some marginal burning and some kind of brown dead blotches in the leaf lamina. Now, marginal burning, one of the things that you do wonder about there would be something like soluble salts being too high, too much fertilizer. The brown blotches, again in this case, like the yellow blotches on the tomato in the first example, will find no real evidence of fungi. So the, uh, at least to start, we would wonder whether there are fungi present that haven't started sporulating yet on the surface, or maybe this isn't a fungal problem at all. Now, no diagnosis is complete, really, without looking at the roots. And as we can see here, that the root system is very poorly developed, and there also appears to be something wrong with it. If we look up close, we'll see that the root system looks rather lumpy. And we know this is not a legume, so there aren't any nodules for nitrogen fixation. In any case, those nodules would be easily broken off, and these are nice and integrated into the root system so they don't pull off. We also know that this is not a plant uh, such as uh, daylily or liriope that forms natural storage swellings in the root system. They shouldn't be there. And so we can come up with our conclusion that this is, in fact, root knot nematode. Now, here in the clinic, we would dissect those galls open, make sure that there's, a, in fact, a female nematode or several in those galls to actually confirm the diagnosis. But you can make a field diagnosis pretty well on susceptible plants like cucumbers, like tomatoes, when you see this. Now, not all crops will have the very large and easily recognizable galls. So you may be surprised to get a diagnosis back, in some cases, of root knot when you didn't actually see these swellings. But if you do see them and you know that the plant is not supposed to look like that, then, then you've got a pretty good diagnosis. Also, just uh, to mention again, the spotting on the leaves, why would there be spots if the problem is in the roots? Well, certain kinds of spots or blotches are actually a wilt-type symptom, not a droopiness of the leaf, 
that actual dead areas that occur because of the lack of water. Just a few words about the management, or I wouldn't even dare to use the word control, of root knot nematodes, which are in the genus Meloidigyne. There are several species, three or four major ones here in the state of North Carolina. The principal one being the southern root knot nematode, or Meloidigyne incognita. And it's really important to know that there is no silver bullet. There's no magic answer to how to take care of these kind of nematode problems in the soil. First of all, then, the issue would be to not move contaminated soil or plants around. If you've got areas that you know are infested, be careful about cleaning soil off your equipment, your tools, your boots when you go to someplace else to work, and don't certainly move plants that are infected into new areas. In some Certain crops, uh, tomatoes for example, there's some in sweet potatoes, there's some in beans, some in lima bean, I think I'm missing one, it may or may not be in cucumber. I don't know that all are available for the home gardener, but there are some varieties of vegetable crops that are resistant to root knot nematodes that can be used. Also, practice rotation. They include things like corn, alliums, which would be your onions and garlic or even turf grass or asparagus, which will promote much less, uh, if at all, the population, the reproduction of those nematodes. At the same time, you've got to make sure your weed control is good because you don't want the nematodes to be propagated on the, on the weed hosts. Cover crops can also be used to suppress marigolds, and um, suppress marigolds, suppress nematodes, the most famous being marigolds. You've got to have a good solid planting, though. A few plants sprinkled in among the vegetables are not going to help. It's got to be solid planting dedicated to the marigolds, and some are even sold specifically for that purpose. The uh, brassica species can be used and grown on the, on the soil, churned in to help reduce nematode populations. And even I saw the references to the use of sesame as an alternative crop or sorghum sedan crest as uh, ways of reducing these populations. Another option would be fallow, growing no plants on that spot, but frequent cultivation to expose the soil to the sun and to drying and reduce the population of nematodes that way. So, Mike, when you're using an, an alternate crop, are you, are you growing it and then you're pulling it out and throwing away the roots, and that somehow is harvesting some of the nematodes out of the out of the soil, or does it just create an environment that makes it, them die, or they move away, or wh how does that work? Well, you definitely don't want to put anything in that's going to be uh, a host or allow the nematode to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So, you want plants that are not going to be susceptible, and also, so that's why you would rotate with those, but also in the case of these cover crops, they're plants that produce compounds either out of their roots or through their decomposition in the soil that are actually uh, inhibitory, antagonistic, or toxic to the, to the nematodes themselves. Did you see Allison's question about the distribution of nematodes throughout North Carolina in the chat? Um, all right. The, Nematodes do exist throughout the state. There is a, a tendency to have worse nematode problems on sandy soils, but don't let that uh, be a reason to be complacent because they can occur on other soils as well. Now, we would not have the root knot nematodes in the... Um, I don't know that we've seen root knot as a problem in the mountains, but I would have to go and check that. But basically, don't consider yourself as exempt from nematodes wherever you are in the state. In fact, that was one of the problems that um, my first plant pathology instructor, Dr. Dave McDonald, up at the University of Minnesota faced, was he had to convince people in Minnesota that nematodes were something that you had to worry about. He was a, a nematologist. Um, and I see Barbara noticed the N code, the VFN on tomato varieties, indicates uh, resistance to verticillium V. F. fusarium and N for, for nematodes being root knots. 
And Carter County also mentions that uh, grafting may come in handy. And I don't have a lot of expertise on grafting, in particular on its effects for, uh, for nematode management. If you are in an area, let's say from the triangle eastward, that gets a lot of reliable sun and heat, solarization can be a management tool for the uh, control or the management of nematodes. Biological control from the things that I have seen, uh, meaning not biological control in the sense of the cover crops, but in the sense of products, I've seen that those have had sometimes given effective control and sometimes not. So I'm not really sure that these are ready for prime time yet, but I uh, don't pretend to be the last word on that particular area. And then just one last note is the fact that the Department of Agriculture and uh, the NC Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services does have a nematode assay lab so that if you are concerned that you may have populations of plant pathogenic nematodes, be it root knot or others, you can have a test done there. So for example, you've rotated away from susceptible crops for a few years. You want to come back and see if it's safe to, to plant those susceptible crops. You've got soil testing prior to planting as an option. Uh, cover crops, do you leave back, die, or turn under? Well, in the case of something like your brassicas, you would want to turn those other under. Um, I'm not sure that it's necessary in the case of marigolds. I could be wrong on that, however. I know in Mar well, with marigolds, it's interesting. The, uh, the Hispanic culture, Latin American culture, especially in Mexico, uses the large African marigolds for the Day of the Dead celebration. So I think there's a, a kind of an alternative crop angle to this whole thing as well that could be done. I know we always dedicate one section of the vegetable garden to marigolds for that reason. And we may be getting some added benefit there. The hope we don't have, uh, don't have nematodes in that garden just yet. Most accurate testing time, July, August. Yes, it would be in the fall. I don't think mid-summer is the best time. When Matt's got his turn to talk, I will pull up the uh, flyer from the NCDA and then give you a link to that. Let me just mention before we leave the topic of nematodes that there is a very nice publication that's several years old now that talks about a lot of these different alternative control methods for nematodes at, uh, by someone with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And there is the link to that particular, I'll uh, type that into the chat box for you. All right, so there you've got the link. Back to you, Matt, for case number four. OK. Um, so number four is a case of a tomato with an orange mold growing on the bottom third of the plant. Um, it's a little tough to see here. Uh, but basically, the description is symptoms first appeared two weeks ago, appear to be spreading. Uh, Grower reports only a small percentage of crop currently affected, but symptoms are concerning. Symptoms described as orange spore-like growth on lower stem and fruit, dead leaf hands near bottom of plant. This is verbatim um, of, from from the the person, the client, or the uh, the uh, person who entered the sample. And uh, so basically, we have this uh, tomato plant. Um, the wilting is is not um, it's probably from being sent in, but uh, basically we have these two areas which show these kind of little spore-like structures on it, um, and uh, they thought it might be some kind of rust or some kind of orange fruiting bodies. The uh, the fruits are also a little odd. Um, they're not, they don't have this nice smooth skin uh, and there's actually all this stippling. You can see here stippling and this kind of greasy appearance and curled uh, um, cotyledons and the attachments for the fruit. Um, now if we look closer at the fruit, 
and you can see what these spores, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see it, uh, look like. Um, and uh, actually, it doesn't look like fungal spores. And uh, if you actually look, you can see the uh, little white spots all over the fruit, and then these orange things are on there. Um, if you look a little closer at those big patches on the stems, and if you're not getting photos and you actually have the specimen in hand, uh, although it does look kind of like some kind of fungus or some kind of growth, they are tiny, they are moving. And so fungus, fun, fungal spores shouldn't move, hopefully, not a lot and not very fast, uh, but these do. And so this is, if you can actually see this up close, this is actually a mite, um, an aerified mite. Um, turns out that it is the tomato russet mite, uh, Aculops like Kaperseki. Um, it is an area of so they are much smaller than most mites. They're uh, smaller than spider mites, um, probably half to a third the size of spider mites. Uh, so to the naked eye and from a distance and from photos, if you were just sent those photos, you might think, yeah, it looks like a weird kind of dusting. You know, the only things we know of with orange dust are some kind of rusts rust fungi, but they're really not going to attack vegetable crops. They're typically on woody hosts, things like that. Uh, so if you were to just get photos, you would say, I really don't know. You're just going to have to send in a sample um, or, you know, bring in some things to take a look at. But with a good enough hand lens and the specimen in front of you, you would see these things moving, although, again, from afar, the movement is so minor that you really can't tell. It's not like you see patches moving up and down the stem very quickly. Um, now, as the description as it was described, they typically affect the plants near the base and work their way up. Uh, they will cause the leaves to wilt and brown um, and start to bronze. And uh, they'll cause these, in, in very severe cases, they'll cause this callousing and cracking to happen on the fruits. Uh, the case we had was not as severe. Uh, it's probably that they attacked the plants a little later after the fruit was a little bit more developed. And so you get um, you know, green fruits with speckle marks and, uh, and little small uh, uh, clear dots on it from where the mites are sucking. Again, like bugs, these are sucking insects, but they're so tiny that they're not going to cause very large uh, damage uh, holes or cat facing like a stink bug or some other types of bugs will cause. Um, their mites are going to cause very small, they're going to suck them, uh, very tiny bits out of these, out of the tissue. And so um, it's not noticeable from afar. It looks like a very uniform and, and maybe a disease or something like that. Uh, but if you get up close enough, you're going to see this little orange dusting uh, that, that is actually made up of thousands of mites. Um, now, as far as control, uh, miticides are available. Uh, traditionally, those containing sulfur have been used to kill uh, russet mites, uh, but there are other ones that can newly develop miticides that can work on them. Um, and basically, just scouting uh, fairly early on, I think, in the planning. And uh, basically, they also don't affect widespread patches. They kind of spread. They they infest and breed on one plant or a few plants and then start to move out. So you see the symptoms heavily in one small area of the of the planting. This was only about 2 to 5 percent of the entire planting. Um, and uh, you'll see it start there. And if left unchecked, it can spread to the rest of the plants. But by the time they've uh, heavily infested the small percentage of plants, uh, you're going to notice it, and you're going to see this wilting, bronzing, uh, greasy kind of uh, characteristic, um, basically uh, signifying that you got the mites. And again, this is not going to be very easy to see at first, so uh, inspecting uh, those leaves that are being uh, affected most, you should be able to see this small orange dusting, this very light orange dusting, which is in fact mites. Um, 
And uh, that's it for this case. Uh, it's you know you know you're not going to have some very big caterpillar to find. You're not going to have the frass, the webbing. So you're going to have to you know there's going to be a little bit of damage that, that occurs pretty quickly. Um, is this a mite that can overwinter? Um, I am not actually sure. I mean, of course, all of these things do overwinter. Um, I think. Um, I'll have to check. Uh, it may be a case that in certain situations at greenhouses, there's, uh, they're different than, in, uh, than out in the wild. Uh, but let me check a little bit about that uh, and get back to you on that. All right, let me, unless you have another question about the mites. <clears throat> uh, this is, I'm going to try something for the very first time here. I'm going to hit new page on this, to insert a blank page. It worked. Um, and I'll see if I'm able to, okay, no, that's not going to work. Um, but from the NCDA's nematode assay submission form, it says when to sample. <clears throat> For annual crops, corn, peanut, soybean, tobacco, tomato, etc., Collect samples in late summer or early fall. Samples collected at this time provide more reliable information for predicting nematode development and crop response than those collected in the spring. For established perennial plants, ornamentals, turf grasses, peach, etc., soil samples can be collected throughout the year. And I will, let's see here, this I know I can do. In the text, in the chat box, excuse me, you'll see the link to the Nematode Assay Laboratories page on the web. All right, that was our kind of warm up there, calisthenics, and now we're ready to have you folks do the heavy lifting through the breakout sessions. And I will turn it over to Lucy or Lijay, who's going to tell us how this works. Lijay, I'm going to let you explain it. <laughs> All right. So what we're going to have is just a little bit of downtime, um, just a, a minute or so. And I'm going to um, randomly separate everyone into one of four rooms. And um, the microphones will be off. Um, you'll be in a, a white room for a minute. And then you'll see a whiteboard appear. And then you'll get a moderator and they will start talking to you. Um, so just sit tight and we're not going to forget about you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? This. Let me see.
right, Matt, um, you now have your um, group of folks that you can walk through the diagnostic session. Okay, great. Thanks, Lee Jay. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, so um, let's see where... So I'm just trying to find this. Okay, so um, okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Can you check up? Uh, check if uh, if you can. Okay, good. Nobody from the other rooms is checking, or at least. Well, they're checking for Barbara, but <laughs> okay. Um, so just uh, just please remember, here's how it's going to work. Uh, let's ask questions that will lead to diagnosis. Uh, we have multiple photos. If you know the answer, please don't give it away so that others can work their way through the exercise. Um, make sure your microphone is on when you're speaking. Uh, if you don't have a microphone, um, basically you can just uh, type in the chat and uh, we'll We'll take questions as they come in. Um, and uh, I'll designate a reporter to make a summary of what's discussed. So if somebody, somebody who has a mic, does somebody who has a mic want to volunteer as somebody who uh, records what the steps we went through and, and uh, what we discussed? Does anybody have a mic, microphone in this, uh, in this room? I could do that. Okay, great, Lisa. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's the uh, beginning. Okay, so we got some two pepper plants, um, both with damage on them. Uh, one's a jalapeno and one's a bell pepper. So um, where do we go from here? Anybody want to um, take a shot at uh, leading us somewhere with this? Okay, take a look at the underside of the leaves. Okay, so um, here's the underside of the leaf. Okay. Um, Anybody notice anything? It looks like it's intervenal. Okay. It's in between the leaf veins. Okay, that's a good observation. Okay. Um, what do we want to look at next then? Are all plants affected? Um, okay, that's a great question. So in this garden, um, all of the pepper plants are damaged. Jalapenos appear least affected, while the bell peppers are most affected. Uh, the mustard greens appear to have similar damage. Um, the tomatoes, cucumber, basil, oregano, parsley are unaffected. So um, that's basically the things that are affected. Okay, so great question. Uh, any more questions? No frass? Uh, no, there is uh, no frass. Um, again, we can see the the whole plants. Um, if we want to look at, um, let's see, the plants again. Yeah, no frass anywhere. Uh, fairly clean. Uh, any slimy trails? Let's see. Let's see if uh, let's go the leaves closer up. Doesn't look like it. Uh, I don't see any slimy trails there. Okay. 
Okay, a good question. Uh, let's see. Anything else that people want to ask? Anything else that you want to see? What did the plant look like two weeks ago? Okay, uh, two weeks ago the plant was not even in the landscape. Uh, they were planted actually about a week ago and this started fairly quickly. There was some growth uh, and then uh, just a little bit of growth and then this damage occurred. How many total plants? Uh, there were three plants total, and all three have the damage, all the pepper plants. Look at the underside of the leaf again. Uh, there appears to be small white dots in the plant in the right picture. Do you have a close up? Let's see. So, um, small white dots. Uh, can you point to it on the uh, using your your mouse? You gotta hold, yeah. Just uh, make sure you're holding down the the clicker or uh, you know the, the the button, just so I know where you're looking. We also have uh, we have some close-ups of the damage again. And I'm not sure where you're where you're suggesting let's see there appears to be small white dots on the plants in right picture. Do you have a close up? Um, try and see the small white dots. Uh, is that here or on the stem? Okay. Um, don't know if I, let's see. Uh, so let's see. These small white dots, I think that's just uh, little bits of damage, or it could be even just dirt on there. Um, they're little tiny spots, but uh, I'm not sure what they are. Um, Okay, um, so anything else you'd like to see? Um, oh, looks like everybody's coming back. All right, everyone should be back in the main room. Um, if you want um, to talk as a moderator, um, just go ahead and click the talk button. OK, so um, I don't know how every group did, but it seems like we kind of hit a wall.
uh, trying to figure out what was yeah. going on. Matt, my group was um, extremely clever and asked the key question about three slides in. Okay, great. Well, we kind of, my group, uh, if, uh, uh, who was the, uh, uh, Lisa, I think, was the uh, recorder in our group. If you want to just uh, summarize what we, uh, what was happening or what you saw. Well, honestly, I didn't. I couldn't hear anybody else talking, so I was counting on you to actually give the questions back out that they were saying. And and what we noted is that uh, they didn't observe any frass. There was no frass. They were planted a week ago. All the jalapenos were affected, um, and some of the uh, green peppers. Some, they looked at small white dots, which I think ended up being either dirt or something like that. Um, and so that there wasn't any any uh, conclusion other than just looking all at all of the uh, the evidence of the holes. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, so anyway, some of the things that uh, weren't asked were what did the stem look like um, in the base of the plant uh, in my group. I don't know if anybody actually got to that. Um, there was a little callusing here and some of the leaves are actually eaten down all the way to the stem. Um, and we kind of, I think everybody probably is assuming this is something eating the plant again because there's these holes in it. Um, and uh, basically what uh, my group asked was were there any slime trails on the leaves and there were actually no slime trails look, when you look at the pictures or look at the leaves you couldn't see that. But one of the things that I suggest is that um, and what um, I wonder, Barbara, is this what your group asked? Yes, yes, they asked yes. if I looked at them at night. Yes, so that's the big, uh, that was the big clue. And um, and so this was, in fact, slug damage. Uh, it does happen commonly on peppers. I like the, the fact that my group asked about the slime trails, but as noted, they don't always stay, and they're not always left on the plants uh, during the daytime. Um, and so it's one of those things where, especially with this general feeding damage, uh, that you don't have frass or silk or uh, any kind of critter that's sitting there during the day, it's very difficult to tell what's going on uh, if you go out in the mid-afternoon or something like that uh, to see what the actual um, culprit is. And so oftentimes I'll get photos in with this general feeding damage of some very tasty vegetable or something like that uh, or ornamentals that have that done and there's no insect or no no culprit there. Uh, and it's very difficult to guess with this general type of feeding damage um, even with the, uh, let's see, go back up to the close-ups, uh, the close-up of the damage it's not characteristic of anything, really. There's not really anything you could say, oh, that definitely looks like the rasping mouth parts of a, of a slug or something like that. Um, so basically, uh, going out at night, you'll often see the critters or the, the pests active because there's less predators, it's cooler. Uh, in the case of slugs, of course, it's cooler. There's not sun beating down, and it's more moist. Uh, so they're going to be active at night. They're nocturnal. Um, Let's see what else. Um, now, uh, the plants now, I have to admit this is my garden. Uh, actually, all the things from today except for the rest of the mites were from my garden. The pepper plant is doing better. It's growing out of it, and we're not seeing as much damage. It's likely that it's too hot out lately uh, for the slugs, uh, but we do have peppers. I didn't even show the pepper I harvested from this that we ate the other day. Um, so, but again, yeah, going out at night, um, is key. Now, nobody asked about the other things that were affected. There was only one other thing, these mustard greens that were affected. Um, and uh, here's, here's what that looked like. I don't know if any of the other groups asked. Looks very, very similar. Um, but if you go out at night, and while I was out there looking at the slugs attacking my peppers, uh, I looked at this plant. Uh, and looked at night, and it was actually earwigs eating it. So just because you see the same damage or similar damage, and this is what I was alluding to, similar damage 
on leafy greens or leaf, leafy parts, uh, herbaceous leafy parts of plants doesn't mean it's the same culprit. So this one you can see earwigs munching away, uh, making holes, smaller holes in the leaves, and the peppers a foot away were being affected by slugs. Uh, and the slugs really had no interests really in this, uh, in the mustard greens. So um, basically, again, go out at different times of day. Uh, that's you know early morning or uh, at night after the sun has gone down. You're going to get a different perspective on your garden uh, than you would midday uh, when people are actually out working in them. Uh, or in the morning, you know, when it's when things are retreated, they're they're hiding from predators, things like that. Uh, so just a little quick discussion on um, managing slugs and snails. Uh, cultural control. There, there's variable, various methods and variable efficacies of these. So one common one is a beer trap. I actually put this out in my garden afterward, and overnight I caught you know over a dozen slugs in there. Um, you can apparently dilute it down to about 2% beer, so you can dilute it with water so you're not wasting all your nice beer. Hopefully you're buy buying cheap beer too. Uh, you don't want to put that craft brew in there because that's kind of a waste. Um, another thing is using diatomaceous earth around there. Um, and this will basically um, cause abrasion and really kind of dries out. Uh, the slugs. Um, I'm not sure how much and where you have to put it, uh, but it's been, you know, you could put it around the borders of your garden and around the plants. Um, people talk about copper tape, so uh, around the border of their garden. Uh, this has been shown to be variably efficacious. Uh, there are videos online of these slugs being repelled and not wanting to cross the copper tape. Uh, whereas there are also videos showing slugs uh, slithering on the tape the lengthwise. So um, they don't know exactly what it is. I know that copper is uh, poisonous to many invertebrates um, and microbes. There's also a thought that it may be an electrical charge happening because of the moist slime of the, of the slug. Uh, we don't know the exact reason why, but it may help. Uh, trapping can maybe also help. So if you've got a garden where you suspect there's a lot of slugs and snails, uh, put a couple boards down on the surface of the ground. Uh, and then the next day, when the, the slugs and snails have hidden for the day, they are likely going to hide under those boards. You can uh, pick them off. And I guess you can maybe have fish food also or I'm not sure if the chickens, they might eat the slugs. Maybe Lucy knows. Um, but, uh, you know, you have a, a they nice They will trade. indeed, and so will the fish. There you go. So, uh, and, you know, humans do too. I guess we get enough snails, you can make escargot. But, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, you can trap them basically by um, using their natural behavior of going under, uh, um, underneath things for the day. Also, destroying the habitat. So um, basically, making sure that there's not a lot of places for them to hide. You know, there's the opposite. Making a lot, sure there's not a lot of places for them to hide around there. Making sure that there's um, that it's a little drier around the area. So not uh, watering the the surrounding areas as much. Of course, with rains, that's going to be difficult. Uh, there are chemical control methods. Um, both have non-target effects. So metaldehyde uh, is commonly used as one. That's the active ingredient in some products. Uh, these are unsafe for pets. So dogs and cats that eat that can become poisoned. It's, uh, it's I don't know the exact toxicity, um, but it's just one of those things you've got to be careful of. Iron phosphate is also sometimes used as a safer alternative, um, safer for vertebrates, but apparently it is uh, unsafe for worms. So I'm not sure if there's a hybrid method you could use, maybe making the pellets, putting the pellets in a bowl or something like that where you're, uh, the worms aren't going to be climbing into, hopefully, but the mobile slugs can do so. Um, so basically, the slugs trapping them in those in those things, 
Uh, and uh, I'll, I made links. There's a really great time lapse video online of a beer trap. Um, I'll link it actually in the chat box, and, and everybody's got to see it because it's pretty amazing. Uh, but it also does show the beer traps that they aren't 100% effective. The, the slugs may go down, take a sip, and then crawl right back up. So it's very difficult completely to control them, um, but those are some methods. Now, salt is the last thing. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, kids and, and uh, whatever, will put salt on slugs because it makes them react very uh, badly and uh, makes it kills the slugs. It dries them out and really just uh, kills the slugs in a pretty horrific way. Um, you can't, you shouldn't use salt, obviously, on the gardens because even though it may kill some slugs, you're going to basically increase the salts in the soil and that can kill plants. It can affect plants uh, adversely. So you don't want to use salts. And I think that probably should be common sense for most people um, who are listening. But um, I would imagine that most people who are used to using salt as a thing to kill slugs when they just see them out in the driveway. Uh, may not think about the off-target effects of that. So, um, with Matt, that, do they eat wood? Do slugs eat wood? Uh, not that I know of. No, they don't. They don't eat wood. They're they're going to be herbaceous feeders. They're going to mainly slugs, um, except for you know, there's some predator predatory snails. I'm not sure about predatory slugs, uh, but most snails and slugs are going to be eating fungus. Uh, like mushrooms and fungal fungal patches, um, they'll be eating kind of uh, rotting materials in compost bins, um, and then they will also be eating live plants, especially tender plants. They don't once a plant is uh, is a little harder, they won't eat it as readily, um, and so they'll go after the softer plants, um, and also the plants that aren't as as protected by chemicals. So. It doesn't, they didn't seem to affect my tomatoes, which are doing well. They didn't affect some of the other plants. I, like I said, peppers seem to be a very common one uh, that gets hit by slugs and snails. So if you have these big, large uh, feeding holes uh, in the pepper leaves, even on the fruits too, sometimes if you have like a kind of a rasping, like a, a divot or even a hole eaten entirely through, um, check inside, it could be caterpillars sometimes, but uh, typically, again, you'll see frass, at least a little bit of frass and silk, but uh, peppers seem to be hit hard by slugs and snails, and slugs in particular. You go out in my yard at night, and it's a pretty wild area, and there's hundreds of slugs everywhere. Um, Even over the pine straw, which you would think would be a deterrent. <laughs> Yeah, they well. There's plenty of pine straw naturally in my yard too, yeah. and around, and so they just uh, they're not stopped. They don't get stopped by much, and uh, um, you know it's 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 hard to say exactly. They say also, you know, they say that the copper a wire doesn't stop them at all because it's just right. too thin. So uh, these tapes that they make. Um, so who knows if you're having a lot of troubles. You might want to go out at night again, see what levels of pressure you're having. Like you, like you saw, that plant had several slugs of different sizes on it. Um, and yeah, trying to put out some traps and maybe you know multiple types of, of control methods might be key. Um, and maybe segregate the plants that are more easily uh, attacked. So the peppers on one side of the garden, so that you can uh, you know rope off with some copper tape and then put some beer traps or something like that out. Yeah, Karen asked about putting salt in the bowl with, with the beer as a possibility of keeping them, I guess, from coming back out after they drink. The challenge I see with that is, is that then you've turned it all in, into garbage. So if you just have the beer and the, the dead slugs in there, you can put that in your compost pile or, 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 or throw it out and, it, mm -hmm. and it's fine. Once you put the salt in there, now you've got to throw it away. And also, yeah, the... the, the and if you spill it, you yeah, can spill it too. And the slugs also then have to cross that, cross that short salt threshold to get to the beer, and mm -hmm. so they may be repelled. And, and I don't know how much, you know, again, it's like if you're pouring salt on an actual slug, it's hard for them to avoid that, of course. If the slug is coming up on some salt, it's going to very quickly retract and try and, and try and go. I mean, it's not, I, I would think, you know, unless it's drunk off the beer and then it stumbles into the salt, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but um 
but yeah, so uh, you know, just the beer alone, especially if you have, uh, you know, you can see it caught it caught some here. So these are these are slugs that are out of the environment now, that are out of um, your garden, basically. And uh, I didn't refill it a lot and see how many I could trap with it, but I only put out a couple of traps. So putting out more might help. Uh, of course, you also run the risk of attracting them to the garden, so you, you may want to put them a little further outside the garden um, to get the ones that are coming toward it. So, okay. Um, so what's next? Oh, um, yeah. So I guess uh, it's about time to break out again. Uh, for a second breakout session. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, four more rooms and randomly uh, assign folks to those rooms. Um, it'll take about 30 to 60 seconds. Um, then I'll pop in and let everyone know that it's time to begin. Um, if you have a problem where the player locks up or your internet connection has a hiccup, um, what you can do is um, close the session and then log back in. Um, this will put you in the main room, which is um, going to be the room that we're recording. So um, you'll still be able to participate. And if you have any questions, um, you can type them in the chat room. All right, Mike, um, you have your participants here in the main room, so take it away. Thank you, BJ. So let us move to the next page here. Oh, let me have a green check. Everybody who can see that this says breakout exercise B, homeowner with sweet corn problem. At least some can, so if you can't, it's not likely something I'm doing wrong. Uh, the last group, if you were in the same group with me last time, I think it was moderator error that slowed us down at the beginning. So uh, quite a few of you, it looks like, are not seeing the are not seeing the slide. Again, give me a green check. If you can see a slide that says breakout exercise B, homeowner with sweet corn problem. All right. Gail F. Guilford, Jessica, Rhonda, uh, Teresa's away, and Carteret are not seeing it. Uh, let me ask the companion question. If you cannot see the slide, give me a red X. That way I'll know if there's neither a red X nor a green check that either you cannot hear me or you stopped caring at some point along the way. All right.
Okay, it looks like Jessica and Rhonda are not hearing the question. Um, BJ, are you still in the same? Yes, you're still in the same room here with me. Yeah, it looks like Jessica put a, a green check just now. Um, I don't know about Rhonda, but okay. Teresa seems to be away. Yes, okay. I'm just going to... All right, just shout a chat to Rhonda. We'll just continue then with, uh, with the rest. So, once again, the goal here is to ask questions that will lead to a diagnosis and narrow down the possibilities. We have different photos, so if you ask to see different views, different parts, we can do that. But again, if you know the answer right off the bat, wait and don't give it away so that the others in the group can work through the process. Make sure that your microphone is turned on when you are speaking. And let's go ahead and designate a reporter right now. Uh, let's see, someone who has a microphone. Um, Jessica, have you got a microphone? No, Mike. How about... Uh, who was that? Carteret. Carteret, okay. You're going to be our reporter, and you will get a chance because whoever's in the main room is the first shot at reporting on their group's process. So away we go. The complaint this time is from someone who is growing sweet corn. And so I'm presenting you, my sweet corn is stunted, and it has some brown streaks on the leaves, and some of it's wilting, and some of it's kind of getting a purple color. Please help me. Can we have a closer look at the, the, the streaking on the leaves? A closer look at the streaking. Okay, we can do that. Just make sure again that I'm in the, I want to make sure I'm in the right uh, place here and don't mess up other people. A close up of the streaking. The question was, did you do a soil test recently? No, the last soil test was done a couple of years ago. It showed high levels of phosphorus. So what was applied was some, um, some muritive potash pre-plant and also some calcium nitrate. The only, actually, there, I take it back. The, there was a test that was recently done not a, a full workup or a full panel, but it was just the pH and the soluble salts. And the pH level in this soil was, I had it written down here, 6.6 and a soluble salts index of 20. Is 20 low? Could you repeat that, please? Is 20 for the soluble salt? Is that a low number? It's not a high number. Um, it certainly wouldn't be something you would suspect is causing salt burn. What was the phosphorus reading on it? I don't have that number, but it was, yes, it was high. So that's why the recommendation, again, this is a soil test from a couple of years ago. The recommendation was for not adding any phosphorus. What does the soil look like around the base of the plant? Say that again? What does the soil look like around the base of the plant? 
Okay, I've only got, as far as the soil itself, this is the closest photograph I have. Do you have a picture of the base of the stem? Picture of the base of the stem. Yes, I do have that. Uh, at least on the picture on the right there, you can see the base. Oh, I see someone. Someone just uh, someone just asked, "Can we show us all the pictures?" I suppose we could. How's that for an answer? Uh, pH question again. Uh, the answer to that was six point six. Can you see the underside of the leaf? The underside of the leaf. I will show you the leaf held up to the light. I do have that photograph. Do we have a picture of the root system? Yes, I do have a picture of the root system. So what you can see here, it appears that there are some dark areas on the roots, but the main thing is this section of the stem here above the seed, and the seed itself seems to be rotting. Anything else you want to ask? Did you do a, a fungal, fungal test to see if there was root rot? As a matter of fact, that is one of the things that you would, you would uh, need to do. I did do it. I'm not going to spoil it quite just yet, but you are correct in in saying that what you would want to do, if you really want to know what the problem is, is have an assay done for fungi in this case. So if your conclusion is that you would need to take a sample to send it in, that would be a very legitimate conclusion in this case. Now let me, before I probe you for some more questions, let me show one picture that you didn't ask for although it was sort of uh, maybe implicit when you asked to see the base of the plant, you didn't say whether you wanted to see it from the outside or from the inside, but this is what it would look like when you cut away the very crown area there. So that decay in the lower part is actually seems to be moving up into the crown here. But what other kinds of questions would you want to ask about the the circumstances of the problem? Have you rotated crops? Rotated crops. My master gardener wants to know how often is it being watered. How often they were being watered. In this case, they were not being watered at that time because there were some very opportune rains right after the seed was sown. Uh, have you rotated your crops? Yes, it's a small garden, but I try and do roughly a three-year rotation so the corn would be on the same spot every, every third year. What has the weather been like up until this? particular problem, it was uh, it was actually good gardening weather, so not too hot, not too cold, and uh, 
there was, like I say, some good rain shortly after seeding that kind of carried them through. Is the, the color of that, I'm, my picture is not really clear, but is the color of that the fungal stuff an orangey color, like a rust? The color is, or this is, if you can see a fungus there, uh, you've got good eyes. It just looks like it's kind of reddish brown there to me is all. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Right. Soil environment too wet, etc. Not really too wet. Ah, have other vegetables been affected? No. The other vegetables in the garden, the beans, there were there were peas there, but they're of course uh gone on the way out with the with the weather, but they were they were fine at this time. No problem in the radishes or the tomatoes or the tomatillos or the squash. So it's just the corn. The texture, it's a sandy, I believe it's a sandy clay loam, uh, eroded, maybe an appling. Of course, probably your average gardener is not going to have that particular data, but it's a, um, it's a fairly decent soil, not too heavy a clay, but not really rich either. Anything else? Mike, um, sounds like it's a good time to interrupt you and let you know that you have everyone back from the breakout session, um, so you can take it away. All right. Thank you, Lee Jay. Let's go ahead to our next slide here. And I'm going to ask our reporter from Group One to talk about the process that we that we used. Okay, we um, we asked about the, the pH of the soil and then the soil testing. We found out that the pH was 6.6 with a soluble salt level of 20, which isn't too high but not too low. Um, the soil test was done a couple of years ago and said that the phosphorus levels were off the charts, so it's probably not a phosphorus problem. Um, we took a look at the, the stem, and the stem looked okay, but when we looked at the, the root system, the roots were brown and it looked like the, the seed was rotting as well as part of the, the stem was rotten. Then we looked at the, the base of the stem and it looked like the rot was moving up into the stem, which was probably what was causing the wilting. Um, and the, the coloration of the, the stem was a reddish brown. Um, we found out that there were no other vegetables that were being affected, so it was something that was more likely targeted specifically towards corn. So we asked about crop rotation, um, and they let us know that the crops are rotated on a three-year crop rotation. So we think it's probably some kind of a, a root crop that's more specific to corn than something than any of the other crops. That was what we went through. Okay, that was a really good summary. Does any other group have a question, comment, or observation that wasn't mentioned in that summary? I see a few that have appeared in the chat box here. Were the kernels moldy when planted? No, they were not. Where did the seed come from? Was it treated? The seed was a uh, popular garden seed company hybrid, uh, early golden bantam, and it was not treated. And the question by Neil, or no, excuse me, that uh, seeds are the problem area, perhaps. Anybody else have a question that came up in your subgroup, your breakout group that wasn't mentioned here? You can either enter it in the chat box or speak it through the microphone. Mike, my, my group asked if it was root rot. We did look at the roots um, and 
kind of just got stuck on asking the question, was it root rot? Anybody else? Okay, a few, a few we, um, we yeah. actually ruled out a couple of things, ruled out insects, ruled out nutrition and abiotic disorders. Um, and then they also, we had, we, uh, had questions about uh, mulch that may have been used, and they asked about mulch, and uh, it was noted that they had uh, added um, stuff from the compost pile last year, but I don't know that that would have affected anything. I was trying to see if there's anything different that we had mentioned. All right, how did you eliminate the things that you did? You said you eliminated insects, fertility, and abiotics. How did you come to those conclusions? That actually came up at the end of the conversation, um, very close to the end. So it's, um, and then um, I think I had asked about vascular wilt, and I think that was probably the end of it. Right, but you said you, you eliminated insects. So that was... That was correct, and truth of the matter, when I first saw this problem, I thought it was going to be wireworms. But if, uh, let me just go, I'm sorry here, I'm jumping around. Um, let's look to the, here's the panel of all the pictures together. But you would see the wireworms tunneling into the stem, so our cutaway didn't show that. And, and no apparent feeding damage. So I agree with your conclusion it was not insects. And also with it that it's not abiotic. You would expect an abiotic problem for one thing, and no one asked this question, to affect more than just 5% of the total. How many, how many out of the total number of plants were affected? So it was a small percentage, and they were scattered. So those aren't the signature of something that would be a cultural, environmental, abiotic problem, or even nutrition. And it seems that the, the nutrient situation was, even though the garden wasn't 100% on top of it, at least it was a, a reasonable approach and not, uh, and not likely to be that. Again, you wouldn't expect scattered plants to be affected if it were a general nutritional problem. And yeah, uh, Mike, yeah, our group definitely, they, that was one of the first things they asked was how much of it is affected. Um, and the, then the second question was actually the distribution. So, um, so those were those were asked pretty early on. Okay, good. Don't be shy. So the the conclusions you should be able to come to here again would be eliminate insects, abiotic situations, fertility as likely causes. Focus on the fact that there's this lower stem and somewhat root rot moving into the crown. Probably you may like our group go as far as saying it's probably a fungal problem and that you would need laboratory diagnosis to determine the cause. One thing we don't know is if this problem originated in the soil or in the seed because these kind of things, uh, this particular organism can come either way. But let me just make other, uh, one other quick point. One group asked to see the back of the underside of the leaf, which is always a good question, but I threw him a curve and I just showed him the leaf up to the light. One of the things you want to look at when you're seeing leaf symptoms, especially if they either follow the veins in a monocot or are angular in a dicot, is look at the leaf up against the light. In this case, there isn't that much difference. The leaf spot here or blotch or dead brown area, it's, it's not going to be a disease directly on the foliage in this case anyway, but it's certainly not a bacterial disease. We don't see any kind of water soaking. What you're looking for in those cases, and this is a, a really dramatic example of it. Here's uh, not from vegetables, but a hydrangea leaf. The dark angular leaf spots visible when the light is striking the leaf from above, and when you hold it up to the light, you can see how, um, how water soaked that tissue is. So that's a good possibility there that you've got some kind of a bacterial problem. So just another tip to look for. And jump to the conclusion here. Laboratory assays were negative for pythium, which is one of the things you worry about with root rot on seedling corn, but it turned out that there was fusarium in these stems and, 
end root. So it was a fusarium seedling blight was the actual answer to this. It turns out, though, that this is not uh, necessarily a serious thing from the compendium of corn disease, which would be more focused, of course, on, on dent corn than sweet corn. But uh, seed rot and seedling blight are not usually of widespread importance, but they are a problem in localized areas every year. So the, um, oh, the question was, yes, uh, the question was whether it was old seed. Good question, excellent question. But no, this seed was new seed for, produced for this growing season. And that is exactly what you want to do is to avoid these problems, plant high quality seed, plant into well prepared warm soil over 55 degrees Fahrenheit because below that the corn seed is not very metabolically active and not able to recover from the damage it's done during the germination process that could be more susceptible to these fungi, which again I don't know if it came from the seed or from the soil, and optimize your water. Not too much water, but on the other hand not too dry either. Now if you're a commercial seed corn, I'm sorry, a sweet corn producer, then yeah, you want to think about using treated seed that has a fungicide along with the seed so that uh, you've got uh, reduced loss of stand to these problems. In the home garden, since we overseed anyway and then thin, this really didn't turn out to be an issue and this is a photograph of that same garden taken this morning. So all is looking good at this point. It is time. Oh no, it's not time. We've got 11.38 and we've got some things to say. Um, fellow moderators, what should we do here? Uh, let's put it to the group. You want to take a, a short break and go long or you want to go ahead and um, and push through? Give a ch green check if you want to take a short break. It looks like everyone wants to keep going. All right, we'll do it. Uh, let's just remind everybody what makes a good sample of a problem in vegetables. It's just basically like it would be in any kind of a herbaceous annual situation, most of our vegetables being annuals. The, uh, the idea is to get a number of plants showing the problem if possible, so people don't want to sacrifice it because they have so few, but a whole plant or whole plants showing different degrees of severity, get the root system intact, not pulled, but dug, and then leave that soil around the root system, put it in a plastic bag tied loosely around the base, and the whole thing into another plastic bag to send it in. Of course, if they're just small seedlings, it may be hard to do that individual wrapping, but the idea is to get a couple of different plants or several if they're small showing different degrees, different levels of, of the problem. I am going to push out to everybody now two different PDF files, one of which you'll remember from last time we gave a sheet of key questions to ask when dealing with woody ornamentals. And so now here is, oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to send the key questions for vegetables. You should get a message saying that a file is being offered to you. Do you want to download it? And depending on how much you trust us here, you may or may not want to do that. And the second one will be having to do with IPM concepts and practices. So we'll just talk very quickly about some of these things and then go into our bolos. Uh, so that's the file that's coming to you. Some of the things, we won't take time to read all of them here, but the, um, the questions that you want to ask include these. You did pick up on a lot of them in the course of our different breakout sessions, things like what percentage is affected and are the other plants in the garden showing similar symptoms. 
and the reasons for asking these questions are included. Again, I don't know if the leaves are affected, is it worse when they're older or newer? That can be a good question. You don't have a whole plant, a pattern of damage. What does the stem look like? What do the roots look like? All these things you've already been asking. What does the fruit look like? The uh, Sometimes certain things will manifest themselves on the fruit and sometimes not, so that can be important. Uh, asking about fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemicals. And compost or manure. Now, there's an uh, interesting reason for this because we have had occasional, if not all that common, but it can be severe when it happens where there are certain herbicides that are quite resistant to breakdown <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, and can carry over on either composted grass clippings or even a manure from animals that fed on treated grasses. So that's one reason you want to ask about manure or, or uh, mulch that was used. And even the, the location of the garden, you know, whether it was in an adequate location for vegetables or strange things can happen like near a walnut tree, near a black walnut that might be getting uh, toxicity from the roots of that tree. Uh, looking for different evidence of insects, have we mentioned, and, and unusual weather conditions, as many of you already thought of. As far as IPM concepts and practices, this sheet is not that different from the one we showed you earlier for the, the uh, woody ornamentals. But of course, some things are going to be different because of the nature of an annual type crop. So the question, for example, that was added here, I'll, um, let's see where it was, or not the question, but a concept here having to do with the soil inhabitants or invaders. I'll mention that on another slide in a moment. And also to, again, emphasize, sometimes these foliar pests and diseases don't cause really significant loss of yield or quality of your harvested product. So think twice before you decide that some kind of action is needed. Practices, again, some of these are going to be repeats from the ornamentals portion. But rotation, I think everybody knows that by now. Saving seed at your own risk, because it can carry things over using good seed, obviously. Um, checking your plants before you transplant, all these things uh, kind of common sense by now. And reading the label directions has that added wrinkle here, making sure that you're using something that is labeled for use on vegetable crops and watching that pre-harvest interval. How long do you have to wait before you can do your next picking? I see there was a... Uh, a problem with the PDF. Yeah, we'll work it out with Lucy how we can get those things available to you if you were not able to receive that file. I will put them up on ncsugarden.com on the statewide page under advanced training on the tab for plant specimen and pathogens. Thanks, Lucy. So again, about these IPM concepts and practices, Matt, if you want to make a comment or two about the slides. Yes. Yeah, so again, uh, as we stated in the ornamentals section, this also holds true in the vegetable section. Know what life stage is present and what does the damage. Um, you know, so certain groups, it's the larvae, they're only going to do the damage, like we saw the uh, the cross band, uh, the cross striped uh, cabbage worms are going to be, obviously the adults are not doing damage to the plants. Uh, but um, you know, like I said, with the uh, cabbage butterflies, if you see the adults and you have some brassicans actually planted in your garden, that's they're not doing the damage, but they're going to be laying eggs that will result in damage. Um, so be sure you know what to look out for, um, and uh, and make sure you're looking at the right thing. Um, and of course, also uh, with this, uh, that what was said before too. Make sure what you're finding is also um, a something that's doing the damage and not just incidental or a predator or something else that's, that's actually going to be beneficial. Um, so again, that goes back to know the ID of your of your insect uh, and pests to uh, to better get an idea of what's going on and what's being doing the damage. This one's yours too, Matt. Okay. And uh, again, if using chemical control, be aware of non-target effects. So 
Um, you're going to want to, again, like I said, with that slug control, you're going to want to choose what you're going to use based on what you're going to, what it's going to affect. Like I said, some of them affect pets. So if you don't have any pets or your pets never go out in the garden, um, then you can use one that, that might not have those issues. Of course, wildlife running around, uh, there may be issues. Um, but uh, if, if, if you're concerned about some non-target effects, try some alternatives. Um, and uh, trying to think of some other specific ones. Um, not sure of any specific ones that come to mind with vegetables. Uh, the flowers on vegetables and certain things like basils uh, and uh, other flowers are going to be pollinated by bees, uh, so you may want, want to reduce the sprays on those and use some cultural controls or monitor the plants pretty closely to uh, look for ways to um, get, the, get the, um, the affecting pests, uh, get them controlled quickly. So some caterpillars, for instance, aggregate uh, or are nix their eggs very, uh, very soon after hatching. If you can find those eggs, say uh, you can find eggs of cholera potato beetles or eggs of moths, things like that in little patches, uh, typically those are going to be the vegetable eaters. Uh, and you can snip off that leaf and destroy the eggs. And that will reduce a lot of the pests that come out of there. Okay. Does that work for squash bugs, too? Uh, squash bugs you can too. I saw something about using tape to actually take off the eggs. Uh, you can just kind of, uh, you know, do whatever you want to the eggs, scramble the eggs or whatever. Just make sure that um, that you're getting the right thing. Uh, but, you know, usually if you've got a squash and you see those little round orange eggs, that's probably going to be squash bug eggs. Um, and uh, And so, you know, just knowing the identity and uh, looking at your host, looking at what the potential uh, pests are, and finding photos of all the life stages can help you identify, uh, to the best of your knowledge, what, what you're dealing with, what kinds of eggs uh, you're dealing with. All right, before I put up this next slide, just uh, picture in your mind for a moment the soil of your garden after having had some kind of a root infecting or root feeding pathogen or nematode. There are two possible scenarios of what can happen once that crop is gone, once the host plant has been removed. And this just graphically and uh, somewhat disingenuously represents two different possibilities, just to give you the idea. And these are what we call the soil inhabitants versus the soil invaders. So if you've got something that starts out at this population but very quickly drops down and after a few years of not having a host plant is gone, then we've got what we call a soil invader. That it's present there because there was a, um, because there was a host plant but then disappears out of the soil. Or things even, we're talking things like um, some maybe foliar pathogens that will, once the leaves are completely decomposed, they will be gone too. Versus something that's a soil inhabitant and either declines very slowly or doesn't decline at all over time. And the importance here of the difference is because rotation is a great strategy against soil invaders but not such a good one against soil inhabitants. So just think about that too, that rotation is going to be helpful and important, but it's not going to get you out of every single problem, especially if you've got uncontrolled weeds that may be hosts in that same garden. The other concept or practice that I wanted to mention again this time is that whole idea of not extending leaf wetness, choosing your times of watering in such a way and your method of watering so that you're reducing and minimizing the amount of leaf wetness or uh, as Mark Windham talked about in our program a few years ago in Roses, not extending that overnight natural leaf wetness into the morning by getting the leaves wet before they've had a chance to dry off. And of course, obviously not watering overhead in the evening when they will be wet overnight. I'm going to give it to back to Matt here for our be on the lookout list for insects in the coming months. Okay. Um, 
Now this time of year it's hard to actually say single out any one thing that's going to be coming out because it is summer and of course we know that bugs and insects and all these other creepy crawlies and critters are going to be coming out. They're active now. Um, but, uh, you know, we can single out a few that to be on the lookout for. Of course, summer caterpillars. Um, so soon enough we're going to be seeing a lot of the, the, uh, the prominence and coming July, late July, early August, and into the fall, we're going to see the fall webworms uh, begin uh, sprouting up on, on certain um, woody, woody plants around the landscape. They're, of course, going to have uh, the ends of the branches uh, in, entwined with the silk and large colonies of them. But you're going to start to see a lot of different caterpillars coming out. Um, and like we saw earlier on vegetables too, uh, although because vegetables are a little bit more ephemeral, they're going to be uh, developing pretty quickly and leaving pretty quickly. Um, I did see last night, and uh, it's going to be that season now for the cicada killers and other hunting wasps being active. All their prey is becoming more mature, more fat and juicy, and so they're going to go out and, and sting them and put them in their nest. The cicada killers are out and about, even though we don't, we're not hearing cicadas yet, but very soon we'll, we will be seeing the cicadas and we'll be hearing cicadas out. Um, also, a lot of grasshoppers and katydids are going to be coming out now. Um, a lot of the nymphs, uh, the older nymphs, are active right now, and soon enough they'll be uh, even bigger when they become adults, uh, munching away on different plants um, and making sounds at night, basically, the katydids. Uh, I've seen a lot uh, around the environment, a lot of flatted plant hoppers. Uh, they're the little waxy, they, they build little waxy kind of uh, areas on stems of many plants, especially on the new growth and the very tender growth, um, but also on the undersides of leaves sometimes. Uh, those are going to be maturing now and are going to result in these plant hoppers like this, these uh, pale green uh, to fully green plant hoppers all around. And then, of course, the, their cousins, the leaf hoppers and tree hoppers, are going to be out and about on the plants, um, and some doing a little bit of damage. Um, uh, others not doing any noticeable damage or just resting on the plants. Uh, hibiscus and other sawflies are going to be starting to come out now too. Um, now that the leaves are, are getting bigger and there's a lot more leaf material for them to feed on, you're going to start seeing more sawflies on the plants. Uh, and of course, many more insects uh, and other critters are going to be out. This is, this is the time of year. I'm not sure whether this heat that we're experiencing is how that's going to affect certain animals. Um, it may reduce activity during the hotter parts of the day, but many of the insects don't really care that much and they're pretty well adapted to a certain range of, of temperatures. Um, so uh, basically you're going to just start seeing a lot of activity on everything right now and um, you know, be sure to check your prize plants uh, frequently for any developing infestations. Um, you can, like I said, some of them, like these, like the azalea prominence, can be uh, caught very early on as uh, eggs and small larvae that are huddled together. That makes them very easy to control because you can just pick off those leaves where you find them, and that will reduce the much, much larger caterpillars from developing and, and chewing away whole leaves, basically. Okay, and um, that's it for me, Mike. If you want to take over now. Okay, I have actually broken up my bolo list across several slides because this now late summer is prime time for diseases in the vegetable garden, and so I've got several slides dedicated to that and then a few others at the end. In general, on multiple hosts, you're going to want to be worried or maybe not worried, but at least on the alert for, concerned about, be uh, open to the possibility of diagnosing things like root knot nematodes, which we saw in one of our walkthroughs, Rhizoctonia root and stem rots, nutritional disorders, chemical injury, which can be from multiple sources. It could be chemicals that were used on the plants. It could be spray residues in a sprayer. Uh, it could be drift from applications made around the garden, especially glyphosate being so often used. And 
this time of year with this tremendous heat that we've had the last week or two, we can get things like poor fruit set due to just the heat. Even if you've got enough moisture in the soil, you can still have problems. With cucurbits in particular, not only the root knot nematodes, as we saw, saw in the example, but also downy mildew, and I've highlighted that, and I'll mention it again in a moment. That is illustrated in the picture on the left here, where we're seeing in cucumber, typically these angular yellow spots. You may see the dark spoilation on the underside under humid weather. The spots can be a little bit larger and blotchier on something like cantaloupe versus powdery mildew, which will have the spoilation on uh, either the upper lower surface or both, but a more white powdery look to it. Gummy stem blight may also occur on things like watermelon, although it, it does occur on other cucurbits as well. Continuing with the veggies, wilting of tomatoes and peppers is going to be coming to a cooperative extension office near you during the next couple of months. Two of the big factors are southern bacterial wilt and southern stem blight. If you happen to see at the base of the plant or the soil around the plant a thick, well, relatively thick mat of fungal white hyphae mycelium with scattered specks, dots, BBs that look like small radish seeds, these are the sclerotia and the hyphae of a fungus called sclerosum rolfsii, which causes southern stem blight. If you don't see that, then you're not sure if you have it and it just hasn't developed fully yet, or if you've got another problem like southern bacterial wilt. Root knot nematodes, of course, can be a problem as well, as can in the case of pepper, especially Phytophthora root and stem rot. We'll be seeing lots of spots and blotches on tomato foliage, which can be from a number of causes, not always easy to differentiate at first sight, things like tomato spotted wilt, bacterial spot, bacterial speck, which are caused by two different bacterium, one called xanthomonas, one called pseudomonas, septoria leaf spot, also possibly gray leaf spot caused by stemphilium, and then early blight and late blight. You notice that late blight is highlighted there because I do want to make a special note of that in a moment. And other things that are not diseases to be on the lookout for in peppers and tomatoes would be blossom end rot, which is not always at the blossom end in the case of peppers, and sun scald. Now, two websites to note. These are places to touch base with from time to time if you are interested in vegetable diseases in North Carolina. One is the vegetable section of the um, of the uh, plant pathology page, and the other is the plant pathology portal. There's a screenshot from that here below, the screenshot from just yesterday, and it turns out that in the cases of cucumber, I'm sorry, cucurbit downy mildew and potato late blight, these are things that we want to keep track of, and there are actually portals or websites, uh, pipes, that are used for posting where sightings have been made of these. So. Uh, oddly enough, or interestingly enough, this year they both appeared in mid-June, roughly a week or within a week of when it happened last year. These can be variable. Uh, cucumber, or cucumber downy mildew on cucumber actually has been reported now in Samson and Lenora counties, if I remember correctly. And late blight on potato has been found in the far northeast part of the state. You can find more about these on these websites. And of course, tomato interests in the western part of the state are going to have to be on the uh, lookout for late light when the weather becomes conducive there. Interesting the difference between these two, one liking it warm and moist in the case of cucurbit downy mildew, and the other liking it cool and moist in the case of late blight. On things that are not vegetables, you'll be wanting to keep an eye out for southern stem blight, fungal and bacterial leaf spots, powdery mildew in your flower beds, and I noticed there were a lot of impatience for sale this spring, which surprised me a little because they had been down, and it'll be interesting to notice whether we get downy mildew impatience taking them out like it did a few years ago. And daily leaf streak illustrated there in the photo, a perennial 
problem. In turf, you may see a number of different things, such as brown patch, fairy ring, or in the case of St. Aug, gray leaf spot. In woody ornamentals, powdery mildew again, rose rosette on roses, slime flux on hardwood trees in the heat of the summer, you see illustrated on the right. Bacterial scorch will start to appear around the middle of next month on susceptible trees, the pin oaks especially, sycamores, and uh, might even see some on some red buds. Shot hole on prunus and root rots caused by Phytophthora, armillary, and other factors. In the fruits, brown rot of peach as the fruit starts to ripen, bitter rot of apple, cedar apple rust on apple also. We got a uh, possible photo of that uh, just yesterday on some apple leaves. And mummy berry of blueberry as the fruit starts to ripen, it becomes evident, even though infection occurred quite a long time ago. And with that, two minutes over, but are there any questions? And we'll have a couple of announcements when Mike finishes, but we've got questions coming in the chat box, I see. Just typing. Oh, thank you. It's a comment, not a question. All right. Any other questions for for Matt or Mike? If not, we're going to um, close out the content session and, and move over to give some quick announcements for you guys. So, search for excellence for the Extension Master Gardener program. Those applications are due July 10th. Um, this is an opportunity to recognize programs that, that groups of volunteers have, have worked on together. Those applications go to Lisa Sanderson, and her email address is, is, is right here. You can get more information about in the forms that you would need to fill out if you go to ncsugarden.com to the statewide program, and then just do a search, use the search button to search for the term search for excellence. We have cash prizes that are funded and made available by the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Endowment. So many thanks to all of you guys who have bought license plates and who have donated to the endowment. Um, that's how the funds are being used. Our handbook is taking shape. The Extension Gardener Handbook is now uh, online. We have five chapters up and ready to go. So co composting, insects, integrated pest management, propagation, and wildlife are all up and uh, available. And we have many more that are in the final stages of being edited and will, will be up soon. Many, many thanks to, to Kathleen Moore, who is, is spearheading that effort. We have lots of opportunities for people to get involved if you're interested. We're still gathering images. We still have people that are helping to proofread and edit. And uh, so if you're interested in volunteering or getting engaged, you can connect with, with Kathleen. The website address for the handbook is go.ncsu.edu forward slash eg hyphen handbook. We have the uh, Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Guidelines are now up and available. They are, the website address is go.ncsu.edu forward slash emgv hyphen guidelines. And that's the policies and procedures and um, physician descriptions and all kinds of, of uh, useful information that's uh, available in those guidelines. So thanks to everybody who was a part of, of making that happen. The, we took our initial policies and procedures and had a group of agents who worked on revising those. Those were um, reviewed nationally by extension specialists across the country. They've been re reviewed by our attorney, and, and many, many stages have processes have been, been reviewed to get them up to you now, but they're there. So come and, and take a look. We'd love to hear back from you about that. We have a power uh, a webinar about the guidelines that's coming up. It's on the calendar on, on ncsugarden.com. So for more information, be sure you tune in to the, the webinar. Welcome to Lisa Sanderson, the new statewide Master Gardener Coordinator. Uh, she now has an office and a phone number and an email address. So um, thank you for, for making her welcome. We're delighted to have her here. She was an agent in Virginia and brings lots of experience and enthusiasm and great ideas. Uh, I have put the um, embedded the recordings of the plants, pests, and pathogens into ncsugarden.com when you go to the statewide page. 
So if you, you go to statewide and then you go to training advanced and then you go to plants, pests, and pathogens, um, the, the recordings are right there in the page. They've been put into YouTube so that you can just click. We had some people having frustration with trying to go through the Collaborate system to get the recording, so now they're just embedded right there in the website for you. You can get the links. Um, you can get information on the program and what's coming up if you go to go.ncsu.edu forward slash PPP for plants, pests, and pathogens. Um, has the general information, the logins, and the recordings, and, and, and other information are protected for Extension Master Gardener volunteers and staff, and those are um, right here for you. Very excited to have the um, Durham County Extension Master Gardener volunteers have launched a radio show it's called Getting Dirty with Master Gardeners that has started as a you know as, as a live radio show on several different radio stations and has also um, moved into a website and to podcasting so you can um, you know listen to it in your car or, or anywhere that where that you want so go to getting dirty radio show dot org for more information on that they're also very interested in connecting with master gardeners statewide to to you know, getting reporters who are willing, interested in doing interviews and people who are interested in helping with transcripts and all the different things that go to making a, it a, a viable program. A couple of new publications are up. We have a whole series coming out on um, Grow It, Eat It um, for vegetables. So the first two are one on collards and one on asparagus. If you go to the gardening section, gardening.ncsu.edu to the vegetables page. You can get a link to, to those. They're, they are both web, websites, so you can just look at the HTML, or you can print them, and they're a fourfold. Um, so you can, uh, if you want to give them out. Just highlighting a couple of resources that are available to you. We have a tomatoes portal and a peppers portal at, at NCSU. So tomatoes.ces.ncsu.edu and the same with peppers. Uh, it takes you to a wealth of information about uh, growing tomatoes and peppers. There's a one for peppers. Another great resource is the Growing Small Farms at ces.ncsu.edu. If you're interested in organic gardening, there is much information on here from Debbie Roos. She also has a wealth of information on pollinators. So you can, you can find information about pollinator conservation and their, their pollinator garden. The, North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Conference is coming up September 21st and 22nd in Raleigh-Durham at the Embassy Suites near the Raleigh-Durham Airport. Uh, and then we'll have piggybacked on to that will be agent training on September 22nd and 23rd. For more information on the, the conference, you can go to the association website. Uh, yes, I can send out links. To, so, um, the, the website has information on the keynote speakers and all of the wonderful things that will be happening at the conference. We've got three great speakers coming in as well as a number of wonderful um, specialists from NC State who will be providing programs. Costa Rica trip is going to be February 24th through, through March 2nd. Hope that you can join us. We're holding it exclusively for Extension Master Gardener volunteers up in, until September 30th. And any slots that are still open September 30th will be available to other Extension Master Gardener volunteers from other states and other people who are interested in gardening travel. Uh, there's lots of information on this site, go.ncsu.edu forward slash Costa hyphen Rica. Um, so, so check it out. I hope you'll be able to join us. And just real quickly, we've got a, a bunch of events coming up. The Cullowee Native Plant Conference is is one of the top native plant conferences in the country. It's July 15th through the 18th. Uh, you can look online for more information about that. We have our own Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Conference. It's coming up. We have the Horde Agents meeting that, that follows right beyond that. And practically overlapping is the International Master Gardener Conference. It's going to be in Iowa this year. And that's the 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 news. Any questions from anybody?
So the, the webinar for the guidelines is going to be on June 30th, and I'm posting the link in the, in the chat, and there'll be a, a message going out about that.